Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Dean Speaker Series. This is the first Dean Speaker Series for our, the fall sessions. I am very excited to introduce today's guest, legendary leader in Silicon Valley and an alum of our evening and weekend program, Shantanu Narayan, MBA 3. As chairman, president, and CEO of Adobe, uh, Shantanu has transformed Adobe into an industry innovator. Anyone who has ever turned on a computer or used a smartphone has been touched by the huge positive impact that Adobe technologies and software products have had on the digital world. As a leader of this impressive firm, with more than 22,000 employees worldwide and 2019 revenues of more than 11 billion, Shantanu is at the helm of driving the company's strategy to unleash creativity for all, accelerate document productivity, and power digital business. Shantanu joined Adobe in 1998 as vice president and general manager of its engineering technology group. He became president and COO in 2005, O in 2007, and chairman of the board in 2018. Under his watch, Adobe has been widely recognized by multiple industry publications, including Forbes list for best employers for diversity in 2020, and rated in the top two of the world's most admired software companies by Fortune in 2019. An exemplar of Beyond Yourself, Shantanu is Vice Chairman of the US-India Strategic Partnership Forum, and he's a board member at Pfizer. He's also a past member of our own Haas board, and he continues to be a very loyal friend to our school. On behalf of all of us here at Berkeley Haas, Welcome back, Shantanu. We are so pleased that you are here to share your knowledge and your insights with us. So I thought we'd start out with kind of a general set of leadership. Let me start with the following question. How do you, Shantanu, how do you define leadership? Well, first, uh, Dean Harrison, uh, thank you so much for having me uh, on your fall series. It's such a pleasure uh, to be back. Uh, and you know, go bears, right? Uh, but as it relates to uh, leadership, uh, you know, to me, I, I think I define leadership as the ability to really uh, guide and channel the energy and the enthusiasm and the passion and innovation that a team has to accomplish something that they hadn't previously thought was, uh, uh, you know, something that they could accomplish. And so. You know, I definitely view myself more as coach and uh, the ability to take a team and accomplish something and deliver value is what I take the most pride in. That's great. This meeting is being recorded. Leadership as a coach. Um, student in our evening and weekend program, um, what kinds of learnings did you get from that program that helped you in being a global leader? Well, I love the evening and uh, weekend program. Uh, and, you know, it was perfect for me because I was actually working full time at Apple uh, in those days in 1991. Uh, we had actually just had our first son uh, in my first semester. And sometimes I uh, say that if I had waited another semester, I'm not sure I would have started because, you know, having a young born in the house uh, working full time and doing the evening program. But I mean, the first thing that you really learn, and I think one of the attributes that people talk about is intellectual curiosity and being able to be with that set of students from whom you were learning so much. I mean, and I think that's always one of the best things about the MBA program. It's the, uh, the faculty as well as the students who are with you. Uh, the second thing I would say I really learned because I was trying to juggle all of these was how to focus on what's important. And I think leadership also in so many ways is prioritization and really thinking about where you can have impact uh, rather than what you do well. And that absolutely uh, you know, was something that you were forced to do by virtue of the fact that I had my plate full. 
And the third thing I would say is that I, I spend a lot of time really thinking about uh, strategy and taking a bunch of strategy courses at Haas. And at the end of the day, all of us as leaders, if there are three things that we have to do, it's clearly uh, cr trying to create a vision. And at whatever level you are, you're creating a vision for your group, you have a cadence for execution, and you're thinking about your people. And so trying to look around the corner and focus on strategy. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, the classes that I took at Haas in that particular area. That's great to hear. One of the questions we like to ask is we have our defining leadership principles and do you have a favorite and if so, why? I would say two, if I can cheat uh, on that particular front. Uh, I, actually at Adobe also, we say um, preserving the status quo is not a business strategy. Uh, if you think about tech, tech is the area where there's so much disruption. There's always somebody with a great idea, with a computer, you know, looking at all of the established tech companies in the world and saying, how do I create a better mousetrap? And so this notion of staying paranoid, uh, not being satisfied with the status quo, that's clearly one of the defining principles at, at Berkeley. That really resonated with me. And you know, I think even Andy Grove, when he talked about only the paranoid survive, I mean, that sort of message is something that I think the business school does a absolutely fantastic job of communicating the importance. The second one that perhaps is more personal for me is when Haas talks about student always. Um, I love to feel like, uh, you know, intellectual curiosity, as I said before, is one of the areas uh, that I'm particularly interested in because that's how you learn. And, and the reality is every year you look back and you say, wow, I was pretty clueless last year. And so I think if you take that student always mentality that every interaction uh, with every individual is a learning experience, sometimes what to do, hopefully more often than not, but sometimes what not to do. And if you take that approach, I think you are always a student. And so those two are the ones that I would say resonate the most with me. Uh, that, that, that sounds great. Um, questioning the status quo and student always makes a lot of sense. So, um, so have you, you must have a certain leadership style. Have you heard certain feedback over the years about what your leadership style is? I was very influenced by one of the early mentors that I had at Apple. And, um, you know, the mentor that I had, Gursharan Singh Sidhu, who was one of the people who actually uh, invented Apple Talk, uh, you know, I worked for him for many years. And I remember that uh, he always, I think, saw something in me that I didn't fully realize that I had in myself. And so he would give me these assignments and I'd go and try and do them to the best of my ability. And when I went back and said I had it done, he would be like, yeah, 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 but that's what I told you yesterday. What have you done for me uh, lately? And why aren't you thinking about this? And I think what I learned from that is that uh, you always have to be a little bit irrational about what you expect from people and challenge them because people amaze you with their ingenuity. And one of the sayings that I like to say is that if you can connect the dots for your company between where you are right now and where you want to go, it's probably not aspirational enough. And so uh, I think people do say I'm both quizzical, you know, I, I take a Socratic method, maybe sometimes to question which drives people crazy, but that I'm always questioning, challenging. And I believe that's a big part of the role, uh, you know, uh, of a leader, which is you're challenging people to accomplish something that they didn't think possible, but they always amaze you with their ingenuity. So hopefully that's one of those attributes uh, that people who work with me would say about me, which is challenging always and always trying to do more. That's wonderful to hear. Wow. Um, so that actually leads me to another question. This is a really difficult time and, and you have, you've ha probably had to make so many tough decisions as the CEO. How do you go about making these kinds of tough decisions? Do you have a certain like decision process that you use? Well, I, I, I don't know that I have one decision process, but the first thing you recognize as uh, a lot is, especially in this role, I would say, 
you have to be comfortable with ambiguity and uncertainty. And you have to be comfortable with the fact that you're not always going to make the right decision. Uh, because I, I would say for certain that not making a decision is more often than not worse than making a decision which is wrong and changing it. So uh, the first thing as it relates to the decision making process is to just get comfortable with the fact that you are going to make some right decisions and you're going to make some wrong decisions. Hopefully you make right decisions more than you make wrong decisions and you don't make the same wrong decision or, you know, often enough. So that's, that's sort of the first principle. The second principle that I would say is that, you know, the more you listen to people, the more I think it helps you put together different parts of the puzzle. And maybe one of the things that I try and do is when you have people in the group, it tends to get dominated, perhaps the conversation by a few people, ensuring that you get every other viewpoint in that and you know, seeing uh, the different perspectives of it, I think that always allows you to make a better decision. And so, uh, you know, sometimes it's based on the data, sometimes it's based on the gut and instinct. Uh, and ideally, they both come together where your narrative of what you're trying to do matches with the data. But if it doesn't, you have to be comfortable sometimes going with the data, even if you don't have a narrative, or sometimes you go with the data uh, with the other way around. And so, but net net, I would say you get very comfortable with making decisions uh, that are sometimes wrong. I mean, you know, as people say, you go to uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame batting 300, and so somebody at the plate uh, is wrong seven out of 10 times. And so if you take that mindset of your job is to make decisions, it is ambiguous, because rarely do people come to you where they're all 100% aligned around making a decision and ask you to make a decision. So that's a little bit of the thought process, but cast your net wide and get as much input as you can. And then if it's the wrong decision, change it. Ah, so that's interesting. So the worst thing you could do in making a decision is not making a decision. And it's better to make a decision, even if it might not be right of the majority of the time. That, that's really interesting. And listening, that's really critical. So just to summarize this conversation we've had about leadership, what do you really think, what does it really take to be a great leader or a successful business leader? You know, I, I, I think about teams as much as I think about leadership. And I think in teams, when you recognize that different people play different roles, um, I think it's, it's more about how do you build successful teams and do you have people in the roles where they are motivated by it. I mean, I, 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 one of the things that I am particularly passionate about, which is maybe why I've been successful is I love building products. And so I think part of leadership is, do you really resonate with the vision of what you're trying to do and the values? And so I think leadership is, is in many ways uh, clarifying what the mission of the company is or the vision of the, vision of the company is and the values. And then people will self-select. If they resonate with it, they're going to be part of that team. And then they'll be a, a well-functioning member of that team. If they don't, they will self-select out. And so I think sometimes clarifying just where the company is going, uh, I think is a big part of what you do. Because in many cases, it's the, like we talked about with decisions as well, being clear about what you are going to do and what you're not going to do. I think as I was early in my career, I was perhaps a little bit less comfortable, honestly, with stating that we were not going to do this or we were not going to do that. But that leaves the organization in flux and ambiguity. And so I think a little bit of decisiveness, I've certainly grown in that respect and learned, uh, learned to do that. So those are a couple of lessons that I've learned. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, prioritizing and really being clear about what you want to accomplish sounds like it's so important. Um, so now I want to shift a little bit to leadership during the pandemic. Um, so this is obviously a very difficult time for all of us. Um, and I just would love to hear sort of what, could you talk a little bit about how you have responded as a company during this very difficult time? And what were some of the real uh, stumbling blocks that, that you faced in, in this during this last six months? 
Hey, that's such a great area and to discuss. And I'm sure, you know, a lot of books will be written, right? Because in effect, this is leadership or management in a crisis. But um, the first thing I would say is that we, we drew up what our prioritized list was going back to that. And employee safety and well-being was absolutely top of that. So the first thing we did was to communicate in no uncertain terms that employees taking care of themselves and being safe was more important than anything else that we could do. And we have followed that up as people have get, got fatigued. We talked about this a little bit earlier. We're giving people every third Friday off so that you know they can decompress a little bit. But this notion of employee safety and backing it up with all of our actions, because as you know, people see what you inspect, what you do rather than what you talk about. So we started off with that. The second thing we said was, since we are in the business of serving customers, are we being as customer friendly as we can be? I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, as you know, we produce creative software that the world uses. And so we provision 30 million uh, people to be able to use creative cloud from home. We weren't fully sure what that entailed in terms of whether they had licenses, but for educational institutions. So putting customers first and saying, we will make sure that we send the message, the same thing we did associated with our PDF and signing services for state and local governments who are trying to communicate electronically with their constituencies. And so after employees, we said, are we being as customer friendly and are we being as empathetic? Because uh, while Adobe has done actually incredibly well through the entire pandemic, there are customers have suffered in the small and medium business segment of the economy, I think has seen a significant hit. And frankly, a lot of the companies, whether you're in travel and hospitality or airlines, they saw a hit. So we, we focused on that. We communicated very clearly right up front, we're not gonna do layoffs. And I think even that allowed people to breathe, but we did look at all our discretionary expenses. And we said, we're not also, we're also gonna pause hiring. Subsequently, we've started it. And so when you're in that situation where you tell people um, uh, employee safety, you tell people that you want to focus on the customer, you have to prioritize. And so we actually went into the company and said, listen, 20% of the things that we are doing are going to gain in importance. And so let's double down because these will be once in a lifetime kind of strategic opportunities for us to demonstrate how we can innovate. 60% of the business may be business as usual. And 20% of the business, we're gonna pause because if you're not going to hire, we have to enable you to prioritize and put them. And so I think doing that structured way of thinking about strategy or following up. And again, the team that I work with has been just unbelievable at being you know, uh, execution as well as thought partners in making this happen. So hopefully that gives you a little bit, but we're, we're thinking this every day as people are now thinking about re-entry and you know, what does it mean to come back to uh, working in the office as opposed to working at home? We're discovering this and I think learning from other people is the other area in which I'm trying to do it. But I have been blown away, amazed by the resiliency of our employees and the well being of our customers. And at the end of the day, that is the greatest asset we have. If your employees are motivated, everything else, you know, is secondary to that. Huh. So you just mentioned something about coming back to work, which I'm really looking forward to getting back to the office. I mean, do you have a vision for what the workplace will look like once we get through this pandemic? Do you see people back in the office five days a week? What's your vision for what the workplace will look like? I, if you remember uh, 10 years ago, you know the dilemma used to be, or the question everybody used to have a point of view on, is our closed offices or our open offices, uh, you know, in a workplace, which of them is uh, better for workplace productivity? I think the new discussion is around working from home versus working from the office, which is better for office productivity? And I, I think the answer is a hybrid. I think we will be way more flexible than we were prior to the pandemic in terms of people 
you know, being able to work from wherever because wherever inspiration strikes, we want them to be able to do their best work there. At the same time, we have to recognize that the collaboration ability for people when they're in the same office, the ability to create culture. One of the things that we talk about is, is we're hiring thousands of new people over the next few years. How do we make sure that they understand what makes Adobe a unique place and the culture? So I think we're going to be more flexible. We're going to have more people. You know, uh, you don't necessarily always need to spend two hours a day each way doing a commute. But when you need to be in the office and where that fosters collaboration, agility, if you can mix and match both of those, uh, I think you will create a much better work environment and better products for users. So we actually have a team that's a cross-functional team. Uh, they call their effort the future of work. And you know we're actually canvassing different people uh, because in, in, in this particular situation, no answer is the right answer. Speaking for myself, I love the energy that I get from being with people. I like being in a room. But I recognize that I don't want to put undue pressure by expecting everybody to be back. And so, whereas there are others, maybe on the product team, who are like, hey, leave me alone and I can do my best thinking uh, and I can be very productive. So you have to become, I think tech was always quite flexible as it related to work environments. I think we're going to take it to a different level. So obviously, you're an exemplary leader during this crisis period. Um, one of the things that our students are really interested in is what does it take or what are the behaviors you need to have to be a successful leader during a crisis? Can you name the three critical skills that it takes to be a great leader during a crisis? Well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough question. I mean, I, I think the first one I would say is always take the long-term view. I think way too much business in uh, this country. I mean, there's so many great things about business in our country, but the first one is take the long-term view. And I think if you take the long-term view, you will never make a short-term decision that you know harms the company. And I think in crises more so than ever, you know, people can say, oh my God, I've got to do something. And I like to say, plan for the upside and react to the downside. So the first thing I would say is that having confidence that it will pass and taking a long-term view is great. Second, and this is true whether it's in a crisis or not, surround yourself by people who are smarter than you. The good news is in my case, that's such a large population that you, know, you have the ability to really tap into the wisdom and the energy and the passion of a team around you. And I, I, I'm sure this is, uh, you know, the more I grow in my job, the more I realize it truly is all about the people. And then the third for me is, I, I mean, I like this notion of, I have to remove obstacles in people's way. We talked about it when you say making a decision. So if my job is eliminating obstacles that can exist so that people can do their best work, then you're magnifying your effort, right? Because the truth is that we do less and less as individuals, you're doing more and more as organizations. So maybe those three things are things that are top of mind right now. Oh, thank you. Um, so maybe what we'll do now is shift to more like personal advice for, for, for uh, our community that's listening to us. So you get up every day, you're in Palo Alto, what is it that's the most important thing for you to do every single day to make sure that you achieve your goals? Well, the first thing I do is I speak with my uh, elderly parents who are in India. My father is 90 years old. My mother is 85 years old. And, uh, uh, you know, there isn't a day in the year that doesn't go by with my calling them and speaking to them. And so, you know, that that comes first uh, and then time with my family, uh, because, you know, I, I have always maintained that when you have that support structure, uh, don't take it for granted. And it's what helps you drive your success. I think every year I, I try and do two things, which is the first is, are you really focused on where you can have the greatest impact that year for the company? Or are you doing things that come naturally to you and you like doing? And I'll give you an example of that. As I said, I'm a product guy. I have an engineering background. I love building products. And I could probably spend all day, you know, just with a product team debating product features. 
but that's not what my role is expected to be in terms of how I can have impact on the company. So I think thinking about impact is something that I think about a lot. And then the second thing I, I, I really think about is, am I changing every year so that I am doing something different that the organization expects? Because going back to the status quo, the status quo is not just about business strategy. The status quo is about how you show up as well as a leader. And so, uh, you know, every year you try and figure out and every day then you go back and say, if I focused on those three priority things, I mean, our biggest asset is our time and time is the most precious commodity. And if you spend that time unwisely, you're not doing, uh, you know, you're not doing your job. So that's, that's something that I, I, I tend to think about. And again, it goes back to the obstacles. So clearing my email, unfortunately, we're an email culture, you know, because then people are waiting on you. So making people productive and then hopefully having a little time to think about, you know, what else is required is, is how I try and spend my time and time with customers. I get tremendous energy uh, from time with customers. So let me ask you a kind of a philosophical question. Um, sometimes I, when I look back on my life, I, I think that I worried about maybe things too much and everything's worked out really well and I'm leading this wonderful school. Um, and I, if I were to look at my old self, I think I would tell my old self, you shouldn't have worried so much and been so concerned about the future at all. Are there things that you now know that you wish you had known before? I, every year you do, but I think to your point, uh, I mean, I, because you cared, because you worried about the outcome, because you wanted to do your best, you worried about it. So there's an element of, I think, uh, you know, what we do and the reason uh, we achieve what we achieve is because we do care and we care passionately about it. But you're so right in that the best advice is to, uh, is to understand that all you can control is your effort. And if you can control your effort and you put in your best, sometimes, you know, you get the right bounce and sometimes you don't, but then you, you go back and, you know, this notion of being resilient is also one of those uh, attributes that I think marks, especially entrepreneurship. I mean, you know, Haas is so well known for entrepreneurship and every entrepreneur knows that every day is a new day. And, you know, something that didn't go well the first day, they've got to just figure out how to bounce back and go it. So I, I completely agree with your sentiment that you overanalyze and worry about something that may have not gone wrong but in the long run, it doesn't matter as long as you know things are headed in the right direction. How you how you allow somebody who's going through that journey to understand it, you're the expert in helping you know put that in in words and teachings that resonates with different people in different ways. Thank you. Um, so to to our community and our our students. Um, one thing I'm sure they would love to ask you, and so I will, I will ask for them, is you've been tremendously successful. And, and for a student who would love to follow in your footsteps, what do you think were the critical elements that contributed to your success? Was it your skills combined and, and technology? Was it certain circumstances? Was it certain uh, actions, what, what do you think was most important in leading you to be the CEO of this $11 billion a year company? Well, luck has a huge, huge, huge part uh, to play in all of this stuff. And so, you know, I absolutely thank my lucky stars uh, in terms of, you know, the opportunities that I, that I have. I think people do their best work when they do something that they are passionate about. And I, I mean, I'll give you the story. When I graduated from Haas, this was in 93, and um, I was an engineering manager and people were like, well, you've just got an MBA, you now understand uh, you know, the business of technology, so you need to move into product management or product marketing, or are you gonna go do consulting? And uh, I was actually very clear in my own mind that I love building products, but that my skill was engineering. and so. One of the things that I've, I think, felt comfortable with is being true to myself. And, 
you know, when people try to be something that they're not or derive pleasure in something that they truly don't derive pleasure in, you're not going to do well long term. And so, you know, the first and different roles are right for people. When people ask me for advice, I mean, I, I say two things. First, be careful asking me for advice because you're not paying for it. So it's probably worthless. Uh, but, you know, what I tell them is only you know what's right for you. I can be a sounding board. And, you know, whether you want to be a product person, whether you want to be a CEO, whether you want to be, you know, the head of strategy, only you know that. And so, you know, don't try and put yourself in a box that you're not, or don't try and be something that you're not. And that, you know, again, to your earlier point uh, about, you know, that's a learning maybe you can't get until, you know, you get a little bit more mature, but that's one of the things that I've, I've learned. The second thing I would say is initiative. I always took initiative. I think growing somebody's career, a company always has an obligation if you are taking initiative to grow your career. But I think way too many people feel like the burden or the responsibility of you know, career growth is with the company as opposed to the individual. And so I always took initiative. I like the business of technology. I knew I wouldn't be able to do a PhD. Give me a problem to solve and I'm, I have a chance of solving it. Trying to go find a problem to solve, that was not me. And so, um, you know, I was really clear about if I was interested in the business of technology, I had to take initiative. I had to learn the field. I had to learn sales. I had to learn marketing. And I took the initiative. And luckily, the company really supported me in that. So I think this notion of initiative, but the first, the notion of uh, passion. And third, I mean, you know, there is an element of if you do the right thing for the company when the company requires something, I believe that that pays off. And so putting the company first, at least in my case, it's been incredibly fortunate. Uh, but a, a ton of lucky breaks along the way. I, I started a company called Pictra. We were doing digital imaging. This was in the early 90s. We thought people would want to share images and video. This was 95. We raised a lot of money. The company was unsuccessful from a monetary perspective, but it took me to Adobe. And, you know, I thought maybe in a year and a half, I'd go back and start another company. But things have worked out well. So sometimes, you know, there are breaks that, you know, follow it. Thank you. Thank you for that. So now before we open it up to Q&A, because I see there are a number of questions in the chat that we want to get to. Before we do that, I want to ask you just a couple questions about Adobe itself. Um, one question that I have is, what is Adobe continuing to do um, to leader in the technology space? Well, I, I, I could go on for this uh, forever because I'm clearly very passionate about it. I mean, the history of the company is Adobe has transformed. I mean, our mission, we talk about changing the world through digital experiences. And think about it. Uh, Adobe invented Postscript. Uh, we would not have desktop publishing as we know it without Postscript. Uh, we created Illustrator, which was the first visual application. When I say WYSIWYG application, a lot of the younger generation don't even know what I mean when you say, you know, the what you see is what you get kind of application, but it pioneered that. PDF, the notion of pioneering how documents could be shared across devices. So we're always looking to see what are the next generation technology platforms that we can focus on to help the world? And there are three massive opportunities that we have. The first is what we call uh, creativity for all. We have this fundamental belief that everybody has a story to tell. The devices on which you tell your story, the media types that you use to tell your story, the way it's being consumed is exploding. And we want to be the one-stop shop to help everybody from inspiring them to tell their story to monetizing it if they want to monetize that story. Everything around documents, it's crazy in this day and age that people somehow think a physical signature is more legitimate than a digital signature. So what we are doing with PDF and electronic documents and automating business processes to accelerate how people can engage with digital documents, that is gonna be a massive opportunity. And the third one that I think the pandemic has actually further raised the importance and urgency of, everybody expects to be treated in a personalized way. 
and engage with digitally. And Adobe has actually quietly become the de facto provider of enterprise software to enable any enterprise, including educational institutions, to actually engage digitally with consumers. So all three of these are amazing. We think of it from technology platforms and are we building deep, innovative technology? And maybe the one thing I would say is that artificial intelligence and machine learning is going to transform how all these industries work. So an investment in that is one of the ways in which we feel like we will continue to stay ahead of the competition and to continue to differentiate. Thank you. Um, I have lots of more questions, but I want to give our audience a chance to ask them. So now I'm going to uh, tell you some of the questions that are coming in from the chat. Sure. So let me read this from um, Fede Pacheco. Following up on your view on decisions, how do you identify a bad decision? What has helped you determine the right time to Well, I, I, I think it goes back to the to uh, notion of listening that we talked about. You know, there are always voices in the company uh, who understand when a decision is working and it's well and when it's not. And I think way too often leaders can fall into the trap where they only listen to people who are going to tell them good things. And so I think with decisions, you have to, I, I've been fortunate because I've been at the company for 20 years and I've known people who are in different functions. People feel comfortable enough coming to me and sharing their viewpoint. So first you have to be able to listen. And second, you have to have the venues where people feel like they can tell you because the truth is out there. It's a question of whether somebody is telling it to you and whether you're willing to listen to that at the right time. And so I think those are two ways, but I, I have my group. I mean, sometimes uh, I, I used to say this in jest, but I almost wanted to create an email at the company which said it's the email address would have been shantanu said at adobe.com because so many things get attributed to you as decisions. And I will, you know, at times to say, no, don't, don't listen to something that may have come down, trust your judgment. And if you think something was a bad decision, send me an email and said, hey, this was attributed to you. Do you really think it's right? And so creating an open culture where you're willing to listen, I think is one way in which it, it doesn't have to always come from within. I think hopefully if the viewers understand one thing, it's, it's the power of team that I really believe in. Thank you. So um, let's see, I have a question from Rupesh. What is a failure that you made as a leader and what did you learn from it? You know, I, I, I'll take a step back. First, I think the reason Silicon Valley is as um, amazing a place as it is in the world is the fact that there is no stigma associated with failure. It's a badge of honor. The fact that I work for two startups that commercially did not do well, but I can talk about it you know, without any issue whatsoever, I think is what makes the Valley such an amazing place. In that same way, and I actually think, I, I have a ton of failures, but everything's a learning experience. And maybe it's just my glass is half full and I'm an optimist. So I tend not to think of them as failures because if you tend to think of them as failures, you dwell on it or you're worried about making it again. If you say, wow, that was a learning experience and it didn't work out. Yeah, a word that, you know, when we moved and much has been written and about the fact that we moved our business completely to the cloud, right? We were the first company, we took a perpetual model and completely transformed it. And the question I get asked similar to that is, how did you take that risk? And I don't like the word risk. Uh, the financial experts at Haas may like that. I say, I make investments. Some investments work and some investments don't work and I get comfortable with it. So, you know, failure to me is, I, I really don't think of it that way. And I'm not just trying to say this as a cliche. I try to think about how do you move forward? How do you bounce back? And if you have that attitude, it doesn't, it doesn't sit on your shoulder as something that's pressure. Yeah, that, that really resonates with me. J.K. Rowling did a Harvard commencement speech called The Power of Fa Learning from Your Failures. 
And she talked about all the mistakes and the real strength of learning and then getting, picking yourself up and going again and how incredibly powerful that was. Um, I have another question here from Alexander. Alexander says, as an Adobe employee, I would like to ask experience as a fresh MBA graduate, what was the most valuable lesson that you learned at Haas that helped you become a successful leader at Adobe? For me, I think the harsh learning, I, I was an engineer. I understood engineering. I, I like building products. But you realize that building great products and achieving commercial success, there's a lot more that goes into it. And so the learnings at Haas associated with understanding the importance of marketing. There was a class that I took, which was uh, titled Building Customer-Focused Organizations. I don't know whether that's still being taught. A number of classes with uh, Professor Tees on strategy. And so I think it was taking the more holistic approach because uh, in my role in particular, if I am pigeonholed as being a expert in one area of the business, but I can't translate my skill to, you know, being a leader for other groups, I'm not going to be successful. And I, so I think for me, it was that holistic approach to business and taking classes that allowed me to uh, learn in different areas that for me was the most valuable because my undergrad degree was in engineering. And so I was sort of, you know, deemed more of an engineer. And this enabled me to understand finance and balance sheets and investments and, and uh, you know, marketing and strategy. So I, I think for me, I was thrilled by the all round education that I got at Haas. That's great to hear. Um, I have a question here from Sam Graham. Uh, what are the major sources of information that you rely on to form your strategic opinions about the tech industry or otherwise? I, again, I, these are all such great questions because it's changing, right? I mean, uh, it's changing so much in terms of uh, where it is. I would again start with, for me, as much of it is employees and customers. And I you know, the, the area where you actually learn the most is when a customer is unhappy with you. If a customer is unhappy with you, but is willing to talk to you, that is perhaps one of the most valuable lessons you can learn. The customers who are unhappy with you, who won't talk to you and they'll just go the, you know, they'll, they'll stop doing business with you. So I think learning from customers who are unhappy because they are willing to tell you the truth is one of the areas on a more general nature. I mean, I, I would say I'm a little bit more of a, I skim, I might go to TechCrunch, I might go to Recode, I might go to a whole bunch of other sites. I mean, certainly over time, you know, I have a preference where uh, Google will recommend a whole bunch of threads associated with it. A lot of them have to do with Adobe and what's being said about Adobe in the social, uh, you know, media. And so those are a couple of the areas and also competitors that you're competing against you try and put alerts for them to see what they're up to. And, but it, it's a smattering. It's a smattering rather than my saying, I go to one site exclusively because the richness of what you can get from different places. And so I'm trying to get some ideas that spark my interest. And then I'll go to somebody in the team and say, please educate me on what this person is saying. Great, thank you. Um, Patrick Kovnio says, as a CEO, how do you balance trusting yourself to make decisions versus relying on trusted advisors and partners? I, I think it's both. I mean, we touched a lot on this, but, you know, I, I think it's both. I mean, you know, you may be asked sometimes to make the ultimate decision because people don't agree on it. And so you just have to get comfortable with it. But um, another point, and maybe as much of it is, when you don't think it should be your decision, even pushing back and saying, hey, that's not my decision to make. If I'm making that decision, I'm doing a job that you really should be doing. And so I think sometimes equally pushing back because there may be comfort for some people in you making the decision, but you may be setting the wrong agenda or example because that's really not a decision you should make. And then more and more and more decisions will bubble up and then you'll become the 
you know, stump, you'll become the inhibitor to agility. And so I, please think as much of the time when you shouldn't be making that decision. If it is, and so thinking about the gravity of the decision and whether it's truly something where you have to make a decision, but if not, trust your team to make it and then support them. If the decision doesn't go the way it was imagined, uh, if you don't support them, then they're not going to be willing to make another decision. So I, I think uh, the more you can delegate, frankly, the more you get power, because let's talk about decisions that are being made outside the US. Somebody on the ground should be far better equipped to make that decision than you. And so allowing them the freedom to do it, I think is as important in decision making, which is who is the right decision maker for that decision. Yeah, this goes back to your theme on prioritization being so critical as a CEO and, and establishing a, 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 an atmosphere of trust so people are willing to take on these things. Um, Crystal Ang asks, how do you create a team or company culture which encourages and values constructive dissent? Um, and uh, Crystal gives a shout out to Professor Don Moore for instilling the importance of dissent. So how do you how do you foster that culture where people aren't afraid to tell you that might have been a mistake? I, I you know I interpret that question two ways, and I think I would say if you think about the way Adobe is typically recognized in the industry, people would say it's an incredible culture. It's an incredible culture. It's a nice culture. People are nice to themselves. Taken to the extreme, um, the challenge is exactly as the question was posed, which is what happens with dissent? And can you have a place where there's constructive dissent and have everybody still feel good about it? And I would say on that scale, we're probably closer to the nice culture where dissent is not as much a part of how we operate. And we're trying to move a little bit more towards you know, allowing people uh, to voice uh, uh, their dissent, not because we don't want them to voice it, but people feel like sometimes that might mean that they're not nice. Uh, I think a couple of ways. Uh, the first is sometimes just writing down why you disagree with it doesn't make it, you know, I, it allows you to have a structured conversation. So encouraging people to write down why they do it. And the second one I would say that's really important in dissent is to not make it personal. The moment it becomes personal and you say, I disagree with that person, as opposed to I disagree with what is being proposed, I think it can diffuse the situation. So there are some tips and tricks on how you can do it. But I would say as a company, we're trying to move a little bit more towards where we can have more, uh, you know, dissent may not be the word that I use, but you know, different viewpoints all come in so that you can create a better viewpoint. And that's work in progress at Adobe. Oh, very interesting. Um, okay, here's another question from, let's see, Sirium. Sirium asks, if you had to pick one product or a business or a group from the bouquet of businesses that you have at Adobe, which one are you the most excited about and why? I have two boys and I will never pick between the two boys. Similarly, I have multiple products and I will never pick between all the products that we have at Adobe, uh, you know? So that's one where I'm going to take the fifth. Okay, I really don't blame you here. Um, oh, um, actually I'm going to ask the last question. I think, I, don't, I think it's probably time we've taken up so much of your time and you've been so gracious with us. I, I, I'm going to ask a question of my own. Um, right now in this very challenging period where we're facing a quadruple pandemic, really, um, racial justice, environmental disaster, the pandemic, economic challenges, what do you feel is the single biggest challenge facing Adobe and, and how are you addressing it? You know, I, I think, as you said, I mean, we are in this unbelievable position where the company is doing just so incredibly well. I mean, you talked about 
you know, revenues of 11 billion, we're growing 15%. Our market cap is over 200 billion, which puts us in such rarefied atmosphere in terms of the growth. I would say when we had our challenges, it was so much easier to galvanize people uh, when your back is against the wall. When the company is doing as well as it is, I think the biggest challenge that you have is how do you keep that momentum and how do you create a sense of urgency and a sense of purpose to accomplish even more? I love to use the word, I'm a, a basketball fan and I love to use the word dynasty and what the warriors do in terms of dynasty. And so I think the biggest challenge in my job right now, if I'm looking around the corner, is sort of how do you sustain that and how do you create the next leg of that? And so how do you figure out how you let more and more of the execution uh, lie in the hands of the incredible team that you have, but think about what's that next leg? How do you make sure we don't get complacent? How do we make sure we have an outside in perspective? I think in many ways, that's my job to bring that perspective, that urgency and that aspiration setting for why you know our best days are ahead of us rather than behind us. And I think that's, that's what both motivates me and excites me about my role because I am the evangelist in chief uh, for the company. And if you don't believe that your best days are ahead and you're working tirelessly to accomplish that, you're not doing your job. So I, I would say that uh, is perhaps the area that you know, you're focused on the most. And last maybe, what are the incredibly once in a lifetime unique opportunities that are gonna to emerge to your point? This kind of environment, hopefully we'll get a vaccine, we'll all be back to work, the economy will improve, people will recognize that black lives matter and you know, we will become a more just society. You have to have optimism around that, you have to have confidence about that, uh, but then you have to always say what's next. So that, that's what drives me. Thank you so much. This has been just an amazing experience for all of us. We are so fortunate that you took the time to speak with us today. Uh, it's really been a pleasure. Thank you. Any parting words that you have for the audience um, before we say goodbye? No, thank you so much for having me. And I will uh, forever be grateful uh, for everything that I learned at at Cal, I'm an unabashed Cal fan. Uh, you know, would love to come. Uh, you know, teach once in a way. I wish it was closer, but thank you for having me, and thank you for everything you do uh, for what is so truly uh, an amazing, amazing institution in the world. Thanks. On that note, go Bears and everyone have a good evening. Go Bears. Bye. <laughs>